Good morning, church. It is wonderful to be back with you again today as we worship and celebrate together. My name is Reverend Chris Carr. I am uh, filling in for uh, Pastor Kat, Kate Payton as she is continuing to heal for the next several weeks and uh, uh, continue to hold her in prayer as she is being restored and recovering and healing. And uh, I get a chance to spend several weeks with this wonderful congregation. And so, uh, just want to make sure that people are aware that uh, there is an offering plate at the back of the sanctuary and people we are grateful for all financial gifts uh, you have given or continue to make here in the ministries at Glendale as we pray together please take some time to use the yellow sheets of paper at the bank of the sanctuary to write down any joys or concerns that you'd like to pray for later in the service for those of you who are joining online, please share your joys or concerns in the comments section. Together we remember that we are not in control, but God is. And although that doesn't make life fair or easy or pain-free, it does mean wholeness is possible. So no matter what has happened this week or what has failed to happen, we are here to give thanks to the living God who is always working to bring wholeness out of brokenness and life out of death. Would you join with me in our call to worship? In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him, asking, give, give me justice in this case against my adversary. The judge finally said to himself, I will give this widow justice because she keeps bothering me. Otherwise, there will be no end to her coming here and embarrassing me. Won't God provide justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faithfulness on earth? Let us continue in song with praise, the source of faith and learning.
be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your great love for sending Jesus as a way of salvation for us. Thank you for the blessings we have in our country, for the plenty we enjoy. Put in our hearts the desire to help those who have little, those who live in poverty here and elsewhere, to care about people being displaced by war and drought and famine. Help our Glendale congregation as we hear collectively about our desires for our future. Make us into a people who show your love pouring through us out to others. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the scripture reading for today is from 2 Timothy 3, 14 through chapter 4, verse 5. But you must continue with the things you have learned and found convincing. You know who taught you. Since childhood, you have known the holy scriptures that help you be wise in a way that leads to salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting and for training character so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything good. I'm giving you this commission in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is coming to judge the living and the dead and by his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready to do it, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, correct, confront and encourage with patience and instruction. There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because of they are self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances. Endure suffering, do the work of a preacher of good news, and carry out your service fully. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you, Nancy. So today we are talking about support and accountability. And last week, the first week I got a chance to join you all, we talked about patience, faithfulness, and endurance. I encouraged you to think about what it means to be Glendale United Methodist Church in the navigation process of healing and the hardship that sometimes comes from that healing, especially in what we have experienced over the last couple of years in our world. So today, as we continue on this path, I'm going to encourage you to continue to reflect on who Glendale United Methodist Church is and who you are. For it is important for us to be very clear for ourselves and for the world around us in who we are. So I mentioned last week that part of my story, and I mentioned it briefly but told you it'd be yet to come, that part of my story is that I have a long history of, in my career of working in the private security industry. Alongside my work in ministry, uh, and I've spent the better part of the last 20 years as security in downtown Minneapolis. I've worked at a couple of different locations. I started out at the Target Center, doing security for concerts, for the professional basketball teams, and then finally at the City Center, 
Minneapolis City Center, which is a large multi-use complex with a tower and a hotel and a bunch of retail, kind of in the center of the city. In the last 10 years, I have been the uh, security director there. Now, suffice it to say that downtown Minneapolis tends to be a rather busy environment from a security standpoint. Though I do want to say it is not necessarily as busy or as unsafe as one might be led to believe. Recently, I was given the opportunity to transition from that role into working with the Global Security Operational Support Team for the Mayo Clinic, which I just made that change within the last month. So it's all very fresh and new, and it's interesting being the new guy in the midst of a new working environment, which I'm so sure some of you can relate to. But the other thing that this change has allowed me to do is to learn about a new industry and safety and security and a new industry in healthcare and the uniqueness that that can bring. It has also allowed me to focus more on some work that I started about a year and a half ago and now have been appointed into in consulting with faith communities of all traditions on safety and security in those faith traditions. Now, admittedly, when I start this conversation or people ask what I do, I tell them I've been in this background of security and ministry, and primarily most of my career in ministry has been in youth ministry, it kind of throws people off. People get confused. Understandably so at times. And I usually get some response of, well, that's an odd combination of fields to work in. Or, how do you do both of those? Or, I would never have expected that. Because often they will know me in one area very well or in the other. And reconciling these two things in terms of their perception of who I am based on that as part of my identity doesn't always align. Because they are making assumptions about what that means to be me. If you, are, if you work in security or protective services, public safety, that world, that must mean you are fill in the blank. Or because you work in youth ministry, and I know you through this lens, that must mean you are fill in the blank. You can only be this, but not necessarily also be that. Does that ever happen to you? Do you ever find that you are kind of pigeonholed or placed? Well, if you are this if I know you through this, people from outside of your sphere of influence might say, oh, well, that must mean fill in the blank about you, and it's not necessarily accurate. How does that make you feel? To be maybe misjudged or prejudged or assumptions made that are inaccurate. Sometimes we feel offended. Sometimes we feel angry. I know that this is an experience, having worked with youth, that people get all the time in their adolescence. As they are in the process of defining and redefining themselves, being judged or being prejudged is a very frustrating experience. Now, I've gotten kind of used to it for people to be kind of confused about these aspects of my identity or assuming certain things about me based on one part of who I am. I've gotten used to it, and it used to bother me a lot more. I'd say, what, you know, what's their problem? You're judging me based on this little part of my identity and put me into this box. Sometimes in a way that would feel like 
it would be exclusive. If I talk about being in ministry, people would say, oh, especially if maybe they, uh, a, a swear word or a curse word slipped out around me, and they say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. But I would feel like well, you're judging me based on this presumption of my identity, and I don't feel like that's fair. Now, I recognize and I reflect on the different ways that I respond, and you might relate to some of these in your own life. In the moment, as a good Midwesterner, I may take the very conflict-avoidant position of, well, and then change the subject. <laughs> or, you know, that, I suppose, you know, that, that's one way of looking at it. <clears throat> or, you know, take a look at my non-existent watch and say, well, uh, I'm sorry, excuse myself and go on to something very important elsewhere. And then afterwards, I would kind of stew about it. I'd think to myself, you know, of course they would think that about me. Of course they would make that assumption that because I am a Christian leader, I am this or that. Because I work in the security field, I am this or that. That must mean they are fill in the blank. I would turn around and do the exact same thing that they just did to me. I would make assumptions and judgments based on the judgments that were projected on me. If you're going to judge me, then I'm going to judge you right back. We find ourselves in these hypocritical places often in life. And our reality is that we are, in our identity, in our individual, but also communal identity, we are many, many things. We are an incredible mosaic of our, who we are in our relationships in many different settings that doesn't necessarily have to be contradictory. Often they are complementary. And if somebody makes an inaccurate assumption about me, it's often based on that individual's prior experience with others who have claimed that same aspect of identity. I've had to deal with the fact that if somebody has had a negative experience with somebody else in the security industry, that when they hear that about me and also project that negativity in my direction, that's not necessarily about me. Not even about them. It's about that other person who had defined it for me and for them. If somebody has heard or experienced something negative from somebody who claims of, to be of the Christian faith, something that was maybe exclusive or harmful toward them, that they were basing it on the information that they had. That that projection, while maybe unfair or inaccurate, is something that is real for them. And the only way that that person is going to know Something different is if I am able to claim something different authentically and openly. That it is part of my responsibility if I don't want that prejudgment or assumption or redefinition of that aspect of identity, that I need to claim it and help teach what else it can mean.
If we claim our Christianity as part of our belief structure, as part of our identity, and we also see others claiming it in ways that do not define us, we have to be overt and clear to ourselves and to the world about who we are and what we believe. That's the only way it gets redefined. In our scripture today, Paul is giving some direction on all of this. He says, and we'll read it through for the most part again. You must continue to with the things you have learned and found convincing. You know who taught you since childhood. You have known the Holy Scriptures that help you to be wise in a way that leads to salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for correcting, for showing, for identifying mistakes, and for training character so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. I'm giving you this commission in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is coming to judge the living and the dead by and by his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready to do it, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Correct, confront, and encourage with patience and instruction. Preach the word. Be ready to do it, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Preaching the word sometimes means that we have to define what the word means. And sometimes it's going to be inconvenient. And sometimes it's going to be hard. Sometimes... Sometimes we are going to have to define what that means for people in a new way. Because if our role is this kind of balancing act of support, of care, of building community, building relationships, and the experience of accountability, of reflecting and representing something that means that we are changing people and encouraging people to be more healthy, loving, Christ-like, compassionate, humble. That means that we have to be open, open to change ourselves, but also be open to participate in the change of the world around us. Now, I mentioned that uh, I'm now working for Mayo Clinic as part of their global security team. And this last week, part of my job is that I do a lot of training and instruction for new uh, staff coming into Mayo Clinic in safety and security world, in the safety and security world. And I went through a training this week as to be an instructor in a program called Verbal Judo. Has anyone ever heard that term Verbal Judo before? Oh, good. A learning opportunity. Now, the term judo is a term that references a particular martial art. It is often referred to as, in, as a physical judo. But people don't necessarily always understand that when they envision a martial art, right, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about kicks, punches, strikes, right? A very physical, very uh, confrontational, even combative posture. But judo actually translates out in Japanese, judo means gentle way. So verbal judo as being a terminology is the gentle way of verbal persuasion. Now, this particular training is applied in a lot of different settings, but it started, developed by a guy named Dr. George Thompson. Now, George Thompson uh, was actually a professor of rhetoric, which is not a particular doctoral program that a lot of people do. 
But rhetoric is, in essence, the art of persuasion. It is how do, does one convince or position themselves to encourage others into a new way of thinking. And actually what he ended up doing was he went into the law enforcement field. He uh, took his whole experience and went into working in law enforcement as a police officer in a lot of different settings. And what he found was that in these different settings, he, was, he learned about how communication in terms of persuading people to change their behavior, what worked, and what most assuredly did not. And as he developed this idea of verbal judo, or how does one persuade another into the change of behavior, he developed this curriculum. And as people think about what does that look like in, in our world, especially right now, there's a lot of assumptions and presumptions about what does it mean to have to convince or persuade or adjust, especially in the world of public safety and to people changing their behavior. But he took on, as he developed this, what he calls his five universal truths. Five universal truths in verbal judo. And what's interesting is, as you listen to these, most of them, most of them are things that I can't really find a good way to debate or dispute. So to find five things that generally most people would agree on is not a common thing, especially in our world today. But he teaches about how people are the same. And these five universal truths, one, all people want to be treated with dignity and respect. Anybody disagree with that? Not brave enough to raise your hand, but yeah, no. Right? All people want to be treated with dignity and respect. Number two, all people would rather be asked than be told to do something. Right? Is that probably a universal truth? We would all rather be asked than told. I know that especially with my uh, teenage sons. They would much rather be asked than told. Number three, all people want to be told why they are being asked to do something. Again, going back to my teenage sons, most common word that I hear if I am talking to them about doing something is... Why? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to stop doing that? That is a natural response. Because we want to understand the rationale and purpose. And actually, it's a really important developmental piece, especially for adolescents, for them to have an experience of understanding why. In my own reflection on growing up, my least favorite thing to hear from my parents was what? Because I said so. Right? That is the most aggravating phrase in the world. And I would be lying to say that I, if I had said I hadn't said that in my own parenthood. We want to know why. Number four, all people want to be given options rather than threats. Now, I had never been through this training before now, and one of the things that I learned is that a lot of this was kind of intuitive for me because in my experience, especially working in downtown Minneapolis, this was something that I had, I had learned a long time ago from some very smart, experienced folks that I worked with, was to say, well, you can either threaten somebody, do this, or you're going to get arrested. That's a, you know, a threat. I'm going to arrest you if you don't do this. Or we can talk about options, starting with a more positive one. You know, you can just leave this area or cease doing the behavior you're doing, and we can all go about our day, 
or there is going to be a negative consequence. I am sure you would rather have the former than the latter, so let's do that one. Those are options. Most people will, if given options, more often than not will make the choices that you want them to make. And the fifth of these universal truths, when they make a mistake, all people want a second chance. All people want a second chance. And as people who claim a Christian faith which has a foundational representation of the idea of grace, we should be able to resonate with this idea that all people want and deserve a second chance. So that as we think about what does it mean for us to be many different things, to be people of grace, and to be people that encourage others into a new way of being, to both nurture and care for and show compassion, and to hold accountability so that people may grow. And we, in turn, both receive that support, grace, love, compassion, as well as understanding we are recipients of that accountability at times. It is not just an either-or. We don't have to just be, if we are this, then we can't be that. For me, it was about saying, I don't have to just be the fun, cool, kind, youth pastor guy. Cool is a relative term, I would just say. <laughs> or be this person in the security industry who is telling people what to do and what not to do all the time. In fact, the best parts of me were able to be represented in the same way in both. To be that person who was giving second chances. To be that person who treated others with dignity and respect, while really hard sometimes, served me well as both somebody who claimed a Christian faith and was called into being that person in the security world. It is important to be clear about who we are. In all of the beautiful mosaic manifestations of that identity, to communicate about who we are, especially if we experience that sense of prejudgment or assumption. What does it mean for me to claim that identity as God's beloved so that I can also communicate to another about what does it mean to be God's beloved? One supports the other. It is a both and and not an either or. For us to be able to claim a gentle way of persuasion and communication. To be able to be recipients of that and communicators. You have a mission statement here at Glendale to be known in the community as passionate about learning. So what does it mean to be a people of learning and teaching? What does it mean for you to be both learners and educators in your everyday life? To build relationships that are open. To be in relationships that are willing to offer 
affirmation, but also af offer new ways of change. To identify things in our own lives and be able to hear it from others, identify things in our own lives that are unhealthy. Or to be able to graciously and loving, lovingly offer those to those around us. As we think about a season of change, as we say, see ourselves in a season of healing and renewing and of defining our identity as stewards of community. How can we provide that clarity as both and? How can we do that? We practice. And I would encourage you, as you are inclined, to look up these five universal truths that Dr. Thompson developed. And think on those and how that might inform and affect your ability to claim your Christian faith in the world today. And see that as part of your own growth refining and clarifying for yourself and for the world who you are. Amen. I would invite the uh, ushers forward and receive the offering and prayers. Would you pray with me over the gifts? Lord, work through us and our gifts so that what comes to us as seed goes forth as flower, and what comes to us as flower goes forth as fruit. Amen. May we continue in prayers that are offered up from the community. We offer prayers from Lisa. for her aunt Donna, and for her stepmother's father who are going through health concerns. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. From Rick and Kay Dunning, prayers for safe travels for all who are traveling this week. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Prayers for Cindy as she prepares for her annual colonoscopy. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Prayers from Lori for healing and patience to be still for her friend Paul after major surgery. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Prayers for Sam's family as their cat Checkers passed away this week. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. We lift up prayers from Gail for Thanksgiving, for their dog Hope, cancer-free and recovering from a needed surgery, as well as prayers for safe travels for Denny and Gail and all family to Seattle for their reunion. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. And may we join together in one voice and in one prayer with the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, visitors. Please leave your contact information in the back of the worship center or in the comments area of our Facebook Live presentation so that you, we can extend a fuller welcome to you later in the week. The ubiquitous MEA weekend is coming up this week. Uh, so there's going to be no Thrive activities on Wednesday evening. You'll see that on the back of uh, your sheet there. Join us the following Wednesday night at 5.30 for a pasta meal with all the trimmings. There will be classes and multi-generational activities and choir practice will follow. Now the City of Savage Halloween Bash there's still some time to sign up to help with the fun from 5 to 8 over at Community Park. It may be necessary at this point to use the sign up that's on the city website. I don't know. Trunk or treat. There we are the day before Halloween over at the uh, New Spirit UCC. Register your car trunk with Sandy Driscoll by next Sunday. And then on the 30th, over to New Spirit Church for a fun time of treating the kids and adults in their parking lot behind Target in Savage. Friendly reminder, pastor care during Kate's recovery time away is graciously offered by Pastor Tiffany. Her contact info and office hours, again, are noted on the back of your worship sheet. Let's see. Oh, let's see. Ron did all that, but he's going to do something else this morning. He's got another announcement. Love that message. Thank you very much. Especially the part about second chances and grace. <laughs> Because as a part of the uh, core team at the church, uh, we're asking for a lot of grace and a lot of second chances. You know, as we move through this period of, uh, of using, you know, guest speakers and uh, guest pastors, excuse me. Um, and it is a difficult time for a lot of people. So um, just a couple things about that. Uh, first, uh, we receive funding in terms of being transparent, et cetera. We receive funding from what's called our annual conference. Think of them as like division headquarters. And uh, they have provided us with $2,700 for what's called, you know, for pulpit supply and for, you know, the work that Tiffany does for us and stuff like that. So for those who are wondering, you know, how are we paying for this or where does the money come from? That's, that's a large piece that's uh, coming from the annual conference. Last night, had a great time at an open house uh, that was, uh, you know, put on by uh, Phil and Melissa Young. And uh, uh, we were even talking about maybe, remember the old days when we had some progressive dinners? Well, I believe some people in the church are going to be working on that here over the next month for coming up. Um, third item, uh, we're moving into stewardship. And so we will have, you know, some information coming out to you th uh, there in the uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, it will be commitment cards, et cetera, and a letter from Pastor Kate. And then finally, we have a charge conference that's coming up. And you'll receive, I only mentioned that today, but uh, uh, so that <clears throat> there will be dates set up later on and everything. But we're required to give some official announcements about that. So this is just kind of your preliminary. It's coming up, folks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then finally, uh, November 6th, that is the day that the congregation is going to receive our report from uh, Reverend Susan Nienaber uh, about the information that she gathered from all of you who met with her here in the last, oh, it was about two, three weeks ago. And, and getting that whole process rolling, you know, I, we really need to thank Bob Black, uh, Mary Randall, 
and Mike Schultz for all the calling and scheduling that went on, you know, to get that all set up. And that's going to happen on November 6th after church. And so we'd really like to, for you to hang around after that day. Uh, how long it lasts, it'll be, her presentation will be approximately, I'll say 20 to 25 minutes. And then whatever questions, or ideas, or thoughts that you may have, you know, will be, you know, tagged on after those 25 minutes. So if you have an opportunity, please stay around. Mark, first of all, mark your calendar from November 6th and stay around afterwards for that. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. It's time to sing again or something, isn't it? Uh, yes, and then a benediction. That's it. He's got something in the back. Oh, wait a minute. It's not time for that stuff if people want to talk. That's right. Okay. Six on up, six grade on up. Bonfire at the Saint the UCC church that I was talking about earlier. Okay, October 29th, which is the night before they have the trunk retreat, which is the day before Halloween. It's seven from seven to nine. Seven to nine. Now, who else? Oh, oh, Diane. So a half an hour earlier, and at Linda Rizzo's, not at your house. Perfect. Larry? <gasps> yes. The, the, the thing that keeps the humidity level constant, I was told, that it isn't a humidifier although they might call it that. Sometimes it's a dehumidifier. But what it does is makes our lovely piano continue to operate the way it has for years to come. I got it? All right, now we sing. <laughs>
We thank all who participated and assisted in leading our worship experience today. May you go forth as a both and. May you go forth today walking into a world that is in need of the grace and the growth that God has taught us to be and to do in the world with love. May you go forth treating all with dignity and respect. May you go forth asking rather than telling to share why, to share about your true selves, to be in conversation and to be people of grace, giving second chances as we receive that grace from God our Creator. So go forth in the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen.